Hello everyone. Let me know on the chat, but I will start off. We were having some technical issues, but I think this was already solved. We are currently 30 people in this room, plus I think it was five or six of the considerations from our panelists. Okay. Um, Hi, I'm yeah, just, you know, um, your, your video is coming in and out, so. Um, uh, uh, maybe if you want to start your introduction again. Yeah, okay. Sorry for the problems. I guess this is something to do with my internet connection. But okay, so um, I'm very glad to be welcoming you guys today for the second session of the Rethinking Festival. We had a very interesting introduction and first session with Professor Jayati Ghosh when we were talking about some of the challenges that we have to understanding the pandemic and our shared future within uh, a process of also rethinking the economic knowledge that we have. This session uh, that we're going to have today, it's called BRICS and South-South Economic Relationships. We are going to focus on specifically the challenges for the, these five countries, but not necessarily just focusing on the BRICS, because we do understand that Brazil, Russia, India, South Africa, and China, they do have um, uh, different realities, but these countries also represent um, the global south in the sense that these are emerging countries coming from a developing country perspective. And that's exactly what um, this stream on the festival is willing to try and engage a dialogue. We are the global south stream and we would like in this, in this particular stream we have four sessions. So this is the first one on the BRICS, the second one will also happen today. Uh, you can have the details on the festival um, website, but also uh, we will have a session um, tomorrow. So th today is the um, South-South Economic uh, Dialogues, but also the South-South Rethinking Economics local groups. And yeah, basically this is it for today. Tomorrow we'll have a session on post-colonial theory for the 21st century, and also a session on the... Um, on human rights. Basically, this is what we will have for the Global South stream of the festival. So without further ado, uh, I can start by introducing some of the um, festivals, um, some of these sessions um, main uh, features. And if I have also, because I need to read some of the um, content which is here, if the video keeps on cutting off, you can just let me know. Basically, uh, in the chat also. Um, in this session, we will focus on the idea that the BRICS countries, will they actually can convey a platform for the global south. And we will want to explore to what extent the institutionalization of the BRICS as a coalition for the global south um, and multilateral cooperation has benefited or harmed economic development in the south as a whole. Our main question is, has the formation of the BRICS increased development possibilities for the global south. I'll also put it, copy paste this in the um, uh, festival chat. And for that, we will have a debate with three of the, our speakers, which are already here. And we will have 15 minutes of remarks, opening remarks of, uh, to all of them. And then we will um, wrap it up with some questions and answers. And I hope that you guys will like to contribute. Also, you can put your questions in the questions and answers framework. Uh, also, you can just comment on the chat. But if you would like to ask your question, you just have to tick the box. Um, um, don't ask anonymously. But also, if you would like me to read your question, I can read it. Also, just tick. I would like to to preserve my name. Um, that's basically for like technic uh, technical issues. That's what we would uh, have here. So in a sense, I think that we are ready to start with the, um, our panelists for today. And we have slightly changed the order. So we will start with Dr. Fulani Tembu, then we will go to Dr. Bruno De Comte, and then we'll go to Professor Karin Vasquez. I think I can start with the introductions. Um, first, then we will have Professor Fulani Tembu. He is an executive director at the Institute for Global Dialogue, an independent foreign policy think tank based in Tswane. Pretoria, South Africa. Prior to joining the IGD, he, pers he pursued a joint doctoral program, 
with the Graduate School of Global Politics, Freie Universität Berlin, and the School of International Students in Renmin University, Beijing, China. So we'd like to welcome here Professor Filani Mkambi. Maybe some, someone in, in the tech could also um, put him in here, but I think he has to turn on his camera. Uh, Filani, you have the uh, uh, ability to turn on your camera at the bottom of the screen. And you should be able to continue. Um, is it best to go to Bruno first? Yeah, let's do Bruno first. Okay, I can do the introduction also for Bruno. Professor Bruno de Conti is a lecturer at the University of Campinas in Brazil. He holds a PhD for econ in economics at, from the University of Paris 13 and the University of Campinas, Brazil. He has been a visiting professor in many universities, including uh, WTH um, Berlin, visiting professor at the University of Paris 13, University, Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, Moscow State University, Freie Berlin, Southwestern University of Finance and Economics in France, in, in, sorry, in China, and the University of Campinas. He is currently the coordinator of the graduate program in economics, Network University, and the director of the Confucius Institute. Uh, so I, I would like to welcome Bruno, but he may have the same problem, maybe because we were not in the green room. Lawrence. I can try and like turn off my camera, maybe that could do it. So sorry everyone about the technical difficulties. Um, uh, Bruno, you should have the camera and mic here next to on the, on the bottom of the screen um, as um, Karen or Falani, could you try and turn your camera or mic on? Now it comes, okay, <laughs> finally. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but uh, we were not allowed to do it, but now we, it's okay. Thank you very much, and sorry for the, for the technical problems. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation, especially João Pedro Braga. We're having a lot of technical difficulties. I think that we just lost Bruno again, and... Uh, now I'm back. Now you're back. Yeah, yeah. So maybe that. like just let me just um, have some like comments. We we're having like 15 minutes of technical difficulties, but I think everything right now should be sorted. And I would give then the word to Bruno, 15 minutes, and yeah, I can definitely let you know in the chat. But I'm sorry, I'm deeply sorry for the um, technical issues. Sorry from my side as well, but I really don't know what happened. But, well, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation, especially João Pedro Braga, who is doing a very interesting master dissertation about the New Development Bank and who invited me to be here today. And congratulations to all those who are involved, not only in this festival, but in the, this extremely interesting network rethinking economics. Sometimes I must confess I get a bit depressed when I see the evolution of the discussions in the academic sphere, but initiatives like this one organized mostly by young students give me the energy I need to, to move ahead in this effort. We all have to understand and discuss the world as it is and not as the mainstream models indicate it should be. And well, it's a great pleasure also to share this session with Dr. Filani Mitembu and with my colleague Karin Vasquez. 
since we were asked to make a very short initial talk, allowing more time for the discussions, I'll concentrate myself on, on some aspects I think are important for the question that was raised by João Pedro, by the organizer. So the question is, has the formation of the BRICS increased development possibilities for the Global South, or has it merely established a new form of imperialism? So that's the, the hard question we, we have to, to answer here, me and my colleagues. First of all, uh, before giving my answer to the question, I think it's pertinent to discuss some of the most important problems BRICS faces as a group. And then the first one, in my opinion, uh, is that in spite of the efforts to converge in the defense of some topics, the bloc is somehow permeated by a structural nationalism by all member countries, actually. And this is normal, obviously. This is not a problem which is specific of BRICS, but all blocs in the world face this problem of nationalism. After all, the world is politically organized in nation states. And those nation states are normally looking after the interests of their nations. So, uh, and the current context is very eloquent in showing that. Because with the outbreak of the pandemic, we have seen very clearly the limits of the so-called global governance. Countries just closed their borders, tried to buy as much tons of uh, vaccine as they could, in some cases six times more than their actual need. Uh, while other countries had no vaccine. Jayati Ghosh, who I saw was in the program as well, has been claiming the, and discussing this issue uh, very interestingly. So, uh, and, and within BRICS, uh, it's the same. In my opinion, the pandemic created some fissures in the bloc. We can discuss it later, maybe. The second important problem faced by the bloc is related to the asymmetries within the bloc. The five countries are all regional leaders. They are all important countries, important economies for the world. That's why Gino Liu uh, created the acronym BRIC. Uh, nevertheless, no one will deny that the bloc has very important asymmetries. It's commendable the effort that has been made since the inception of the bloc to design a structure of governance, giving the same weight in the votes for all five members, notably in the institutions and the BU that were created. But well, we know that this is important, but not enough to assure equality. One of the member countries is far more important for the world economy nowadays, having also a higher geopolitical power, which is China, obviously. And it has effects within the bloc, no doubt about it. Just to give an example, the New Development Bank is supposed to give loans in the BRICS countries' currencies, contributing somehow to the effort of reducing the dependence on the US dollar. And when we see the data, what do we see? We see that uh, almost all loans which are not in US dollars are in Chinese renminbi, okay? as one would expect. So it shows, it's one of the examples of those asymmetries. And those asymmetries require, obviously, a permanent effort of the five countries to mitigate the power imbalances within the bloc. The third big problem BRICS still faces is the dependency on the presidents or the heads who are in office in the five countries. It's true that the bloc has been very successful in creating some state commitments, this is really important, which are being followed by all countries, irrespectively of who is in office, notably in regard to, to NDB and, and CRA. But it's also undeniable that a figure like Bolsonaro, Brazilian current president, takes office, the bloc becomes immediately weaker. And here, uh, under the request of the organizers, I'll talk a little bit about my, my country, Brazil, because Brazil is a good example for my argument. Uh, it, it had the presidents of BRICS in 2019, already under the government of Bolsonaro, and obviously Bolsonaro followed some commitments. Most importantly, uh, the government organized the summit that was held in Brasilia. So it, it was not possible for him to just abandon the bloc. It would be a shame for him, with negative consequences for his government. But do you know how he initiated his speech in the opening ceremony in Brasilia summit? By saying that the Brazilian interests are above all other interests. What is true for all countries, all, all heads of states think like that, but you may agree with me that it's not very polite for a multilateral summit to start like that. And, and the summit was very timid in terms of proposals. Some initiatives like the BRICS Network University were simply abandoned, and the focus was only in the economic opportunities brought by BRICS. 
no word by Bolsonaro, no serial action uh, from the Brazilian government relate to the geopolitical arena, which is in the DNA of BRICS. Besides that, Bolsonaro himself and many members of his government, including the former Minister of Foreign Affairs, are constantly making very offensive declarations about China, talking about the Chinese, Chinese virus and so on. And stating, see how important it is, stating that Brazil is aligned to the Western Christian civilization, uh, which is an alignment which is simply opposed to the meaning of BRICS, to the essence of BRICS. All right. So actually, uh, Bolsonaro government expressed uh, under Trump's administration the most disgusting subordination to the USA. And BRICS is clearly not a priority for his government, as it was under Dilma Rousseff's administration, for instance. Uh, during the pandemic as well, the Brazilian government was reluctant to adhere to India and South Africa's proposal for a temporary waiver for the vaccine patents. It did it later, but it was reluctant. Uh, it's dealing with Sputnik vaccine as a geopolitical case and not as a sanitary case and so on. So obviously, the head of state who is in office may create some disturbances in BRICS. But well, uh, having briefly analyzed it, and here I come to the second half of my presentation, having briefly analyzed those big challenges faced by the BRICS, I have to say that I do see, in spite of all that, I do see BRICS as a positive construction. And to come back to the question uh, which the organizes our debate today, I personally do not put the label of imperialism in the BRICS. And I don't use this label for the BRICS, but it does not mean I don't think this concept is valid anymore, not at all. In my opinion, the concept of imperialism is still extremely valid and useful. But I see imperialism in the attitude of the United States in his policy in the Middle East, for instance, in Syria. In the attitude of France in regard to its ex-colonies in Africa, for instance. And even if you talk about a new kind of imperialism where finance plays a very important role, as stated by, by Nkrumah in his book Neocolonialism, Last Stage of Imperialism. I see imperialism in the conditionalities imposed by the IMF and the World Bank, imposing neoliberal reforms or austerity policies, even in countries which had already emergency situations of poverty and starvation, even before the pandemic. I see imperialism in the control of the African franc by France, just to give some examples. Uh, BRICS countries may have attitudes we may consider as not desirable in their, in their bilateral relations with some countries in the world, this is true, but it happens precisely due to the power asymmetries, which are one of the most striking characteristics of the world, as I discussed it earlier. I, I won't deny that we may see situations in which one of the BRICS countries is taking benefit from this power asymmetry, but this is related to the quest for the national interest is also, which I also discussed in the beginning of my presentation. Uh, but in my opinion, it does not allow us to say that BRICS as a block acts in an imperialist way. See the difference? Europe has acted as a block to divide and subordinate Africa in the Berlin Conference. NATO member countries act as a block to intervene through war in countries in the Middle East, for instance. This is different. So uh, to conclude, uh, I move to the uh -huh. other part of the question. Ha and the second part is, has the formation of the BRICS increased the development possibilities for, for the Global South? And here again, uh, I don't think we may have a, a simple answer. To initiate my answer, I would say that, uh, unfortunately, I don't see in the BRICS very clearly a kind of a Bandung spirit. Uh, I stimulate our students here to read the Bandung final communique, and it's very clear in the defense of the Global South, the sovereignty of each people, the necessity for the countries of the Global South to construct their own universities, so and it's a stimulus to a decolonization of the academic thought and so on. This in the final communique of the Bandung conference. And BRICS, in my opinion, so far has been more modest in, 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 the, in these claims. Uh, but, uh, in my opinion, BRICS is still under construction and it has a big potential to fight for very interesting things, notably related to a confrontation to the geopolitical status quo. 
the, the mere existence of a block which is taken as a powerful block by the core countries changes the situation in the geopolitical arena. It's undeniable. It, it, it at least forces those traditional core countries to think twice before implementing their international policies. Uh, I don't have the illusion that BRICS will be any panacea, inevit inevitably changing the world for good, because uh, BRICS is embedded in the current world. So it brings the problems of the current world, very importantly, the ones I discussed in the beginning of my presentation, namely nationalism, asymmetries, and political instability. It's part of the world, it's part of BRICS as well. But, but, but I do think the bloc may have an important role in the battles for a new order, in the construction of the new order. After all, the construction of a new order needs 1,000 steps, but the first and, and crucial one is having important actors questioning the status quo, questioning a world in which the absolute hegemony of the Western countries, and notably the USA, has brought terrible consequences for most of the world population, notably in the global periphery. So, and here I really conclude, uh, I would say we should avoid a dichotomy when we analyze BRICS. In my opinion, it has a big and positive potential in challenging the status quo, but obviously it's embedded in, in the material ground, material ground. It's embedded in the current world, so it brings some of the important contradictions of capitalism, some of the important contradictions of this world. So we have to work hard and to discuss this topic a lot to follow the evolution of BRICS in the near future, hopefully contributing as well to develop this potential which exists, in my opinion, to bring light uh, and give voice to the global south. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bruno, for this quite interesting and insightful presentation and speech on, on the BRICS. And that kind of makes me think whether the BRICS are actually that transformative uh, coalition and transformative group of countries. Because indeed, uh, if they are not reproducing some of the imperialistic um, characteristics that we see from the IMF, or either also when you go back in history from the Berlin Conference, uh, they are not doing the full uh, package that they actually could be doing for the Global South countries. And in a sense, um, I think that we already have some of the questions and answers, but please feel free to um, continue contribute to this ones here but also like I do feel that the BRICS have a positive contribution for global south possibilities of development in the 21st century um okay thank you again oh so maybe should we go for Filani right now maybe he can turn on his camera I'm not sure if he's already uh, able to do so can you try it Filani okay great yeah uh, yeah, I have a, a different uh, browser, um, and then yeah, I had some issues. Uh, and I managed to at least catch most of the previous um, input. Um, so, colleagues, let me jump straight into it. Um, I may not need the full uh, time, but let's see where it goes. Um, essentially, what I'm, I'm structuring my presentation on is around, uh, you know, the whole idea of um, the BRICS and multilateralism in a multipolar world. Um, and basically interrogating whether this provides more space for developing countries. Uh, space, both in terms of policy space uh, to implement um, various national and regional development uh, plans um, in the absence of an explicit interference um, from external actors, um, but also in terms of just offering more options for developing countries, um, especially in the area of development cooperation and more specifically within the area of development finance. And I argue that um, indeed uh, the emergence of BRICS. The emergence of BRICS is important, yes, in and of itself, but it is also important in terms of what it signifies within the broader geopolitical landscape. I think what you are seeing is that um, we are essentially moving, uh, and in fact, we are beyond unipolarity now. Um, but what we've witnessed 
is a shift, you know, from unipolarity uh, to an increasingly multipolar world order, and we're witnessing the consequences thereof. Um, so I argue that the rise of southern powers um, and the establishment of groups such as the BRICS, um, it's gradually ushering in a multipolar world order. Uh, and this multipolar world order re uh, requires new thinking, it requires global governance reforms, and it requires new institutions uh, to solve the most pressing global problems. Uh, I think that's where we should see, uh, or at least frame, the emergence of BRICS uh, 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 within. Um, in a sense that it has come, you know, you're quite right, I think the previous discussion, that at times, um, observers of BRICS um, impose their own normative um, sort of perspectives of what BRICS should represent, rather than what the um, what the organization or what the grouping itself states that it represents. Um, so sometimes there is a mismatch in terms of what is expected of BRICS and what you know the BRICS is really about. It's certainly much more reformist than you know trying to overturn the the global order, for instance. Um, but of course, reform is an important area uh, within um, you know within restructuring international relations. So I think this is quite important because what it means is that yes, we need new thinking, uh, we need global governance reforms and we need new institutions. And the BRICS countries are providing some of these. So they're injecting new thinking into uh, the international development landscape, um, especially when you take into account that these are countries that are in fact vastly different. Now these differences have been pointed out you know, since the foundation of, 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 the, of the BRICS grouping. In fact, most of the detractors of the BRICS were using those differences, you know, to argue that how could countries that are essentially so different uh, in terms of political systems, in terms of uh, underpinning values, in terms of systems of government, uh, in terms of the size and of their economies, so how could countries that are so different, you know, band together uh, within um, a grouping such as the BRICS? But I think what that has done is that heterogeneity has injected some new thinking uh, within uh, global governance institutions. And it can only be good for the aspirations of global governance reforms. And what we, why we've seen this importance, we've seen that, you know, multilateralism is important. Uh, we've seen it throughout the COVID-19 um, pandemic and the essential crisis of multilateralism, um, where we haven't seen the types of cooperation that one would have expected or hoped to see in the midst of a pandemic. And the question is whether BRICS countries can actually play a role in building resilience within the existing multilateral institutions. Uh, in fact, what we've been seeing is that some of the founders of these multilateral institutions are ones turning their backs um, towards the actual principles that founded these multilateral structures. Um, so that is something that has been obviously quite interesting to observe. And the question is whether BRICS countries can actually play a bridge, a bridging role between the global south and the global north. Uh, and the question is then on whose terms, you know, will this bridging uh, be, uh, or will this bridge actually be built? A second, you know, key part once, you know, sort of factoring in the broader context of the rise of southern powers um, and the move towards a multipolar world order is, I think, the importance of factoring the idea of building 
uh, the future multilateral architecture and what role inclusivity uh, has in a sense that what role do uh, both state and non-state actors play within a reformed multilateral order. What we've seen just briefly within the BRICS is that each year we're seeing at least 100 meetings that are taking place amongst BRICS countries. These meetings are taking place at a government level, a ministerial level, um, technical experts level. They're taking place at summit level amongst heads of state. Um, and they're taking place amongst um, private sector, amongst civil society actors, amongst think tanks, amongst universities uh, in the BRICS countries, and amongst trade unions amongst the BRICS countries. Now, that's a, quite a number of meetings. I mean, it's about 100 each year that have been taking place in recent years. And I think uh, precisely going back to the first presentation about, for instance, the impact of Bolsonaro, I think the impact of having these 100 plus meetings per annum amongst BRICS countries, these are the type of meetings that are going to build the type of resilience that the BRICS grouping is looking to have. So that even if you have someone like Bolsonaro, uh, who maybe does not see BRICS as the most important area within his foreign policy, but the fact that you have this network of meetings and discussions and joint research um, and business that is taking place amongst non-state actors in the BRICS grouping, that actually sets quite a framework for uh, building greater resilience in the partnership uh, moving forward. Um, so that's sort of on, 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 on that multiple track diplomacy front. I think also what's important is that, um, is that, you know, the reformist agenda of BRICS has been centered on really, you know, some areas such as the UN Security Council, even though there isn't, I mean, there's agreement that there should be reform, but there isn't agreement on exactly what shape or form that reform uh, should actually take especially taking into account that Russia and China uh, are permanent members and uh, the other BRICS countries are not uh, permanent members. So there isn't agreement on the exact modalities of reform, although there's a tacit, well, there's acknowledgement that reform should take place. Um, there's obviously also been strides within the World Trade Organization where BRICS countries have, even prior to the formation of BRICS, played a very key role uh, within your Doha uh, development agenda, uh, pushing you know, for, um, for the reform of the WTO and also pushing for greater policy space amongst developing countries, especially even in areas such as industrial policy, uh, where Western countries you know, did not really allow the type of policy space in the developing world that was arguably required. So, you know, there is an argument that there with the rise of countries within the BRICS, uh, that it should allow within the trading landscape, it should, and other areas, it should allow for greater policy space uh, for developing countries. And that obviously gives those developing countries the opportunity to pick and choose, obviously, who they work with, which is not to say that BRICS replaces anyone, um, but it acts as, 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 as offering greater choice, I think, to developing countries. So that's important on the WTO side. And I think BRICS countries will obviously keep looking to, to, to push for reforms there. But the other sides of contestation have come through the IMF and the World Bank, uh, where they've worked quite cohesively. And I think these are the areas where they've worked really closely in pushing for um, um, you know, reforms within uh, the Bretton Woods institutions. Um, so that has been quite, an, and, and they have achieved uh, some uh, progress uh, in terms of reforming those institutions. But I think what's also been interesting is that the BRICS countries have been pushing for reforms both within institutions of global governance, but also pushing for reform by establishing their own institutions 
such as the New Development Bank. And that allows you to apply pressure on global governance reforms through your example. So for instance, the NDB has provided um, you know, different uh, uh, funding prior to the pandemic uh, whether it's some of the green infrastructure projects that are being financed uh, within the BRICS countries, uh, whether it is the emergency COVID-related funds uh, that uh, the NDB was very quick uh, to disperse. Um, but also, you know, essentially what this means is that you do have um, a new injection of development finance, um, but you also have, I think, a different model that we are seeing, um, you know, and, 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 and by this example, it actually sends signals to existing development finance institutions uh, on different ways in which development finance uh, could be um, um, uh, distributed. So essentially what the New Development Bank has an opportunity to do is not only, I think, to be a funding mechanism, but also to be sort of a knowledge bank and, and, and come to ideas such as, yes, rethinking uh, development. I mean, when we think about the BRICS countries, they all have different development models, um, but they are not necessarily pushing for a homogenous uh, model of development. And I think that's very good in a sense that it injects new ideas. It actually shows to the world that there are different ways of achieving your goals. Uh, none of these countries are perfect. Um, you know, they all have their own internal challenges. But I think it, it's, it's a far cry from thinking back to the height of your Washington consensus where each country was sort of told that this is the path to development. And if you stray from this path, there will be consequences. Um, and that's not a sustainable model. So the fact that BRICS countries do come with a, het a, a, a heterogeneous sort of uh, approach to development and to development finance, both individually in a sense that they play important development finance roles in their own regions, but also as a collective through the new development bank. I think what that will add is new ideas within the development finance uh, landscape. And that's something that must be welcome because it's something that does offer options uh, to developing countries, but it also offers, I think, um, um, uh, potentially at least among some developing countries, it offers greater uh, policy space um, within the development finance world. And I think that's an important contribution, you know, that BRICS countries are making in this area, sometimes intentionally, but sometimes um, simply, you know, as a, as a, a sort of spillover effects of uh, BRICS cooperation. Um, so, you know, just to conclude, I think the main things there is that, yes, the BRICS countries do offer uh, greater options, um, but it's not necessarily an automatic uh, process that the emergence of the BRICS will lead to development in the developing world. Um, but what it does is it sets the conditions um, for, for developing countries um, to have greater agency in actually choosing what development models um, to actually uh, advocate for and to implement uh, within their own. And then lastly, it um, obviously I think what that could potentially do, sort of an optimistic scenario, is that it might uh, inject greater resilience within the, um, the system of uh, international cooperation. Because if you think back, really, um, for the past, you know, couple of decades, um, let's say since the end of World War II, we haven't really had a diverse, um, um, we haven't had diverse thinking within 
uh, institution building globally within development models that have been approached uh, between with policy advice that we've seen from um, your Bretton Woods institutions. Um, so this is arguably the period which is seeing much greater diversity of approaches and of ideas. Um, and that will mean that developed countries will also have to adapt because they are used to uh, an international landscape where, for instance, the OECD has the monopoly on ideas about development, about the role of the state, about the role of the market, and so forth. So there will have to be some level of adjustment from the developed world um, to better understand the type of reforms that BRICS countries have been uh, seeking both individually uh, and as a collective. So let me stop there. Thanks, colleagues. Thank you very much, Filani, for this very interesting perspective on the BRICS, but also on the understanding that global governance is a work in progress and definitely that different countries and different blocks will contribute differently coming from their development perspectives, but also coming from the way that they interact with the international relations uh, scenario, the BRICS uh, laid on uh, when they are emerging, when, when they consolidate as rising powers. Um, okay, we have had some technical issues in the beginning and we have continued to have have them. So our third speaker, Professor Karin Vasquez, could not join uh, us. We, I mean, we could join, uh, we can have her in the um, smartphone version, but sadly we cannot turn her mic on, neither her camera on. So I apologize for this um, feature that we were trying to incorporate this year with Remo. Remo is a very good software. It allows us to have a um, more interactive perspective with um, our panelists and also within ourselves, our members and um, the participants of this festival. But suddenly we could not have cutting for today's um, session. So I would maybe ask Karen if she would have like uh, maybe some bullet points at some point, or she, if, she, if she has something written, she could. If not, it's also okay, we understand it. And I would suggest then that we would go to our debate part of the, the session. And we have some five or six questions. Maybe uh, if the other participants would like to see you ask them, it would be good. Uh, but if not, I would then invite Bruno and Filani to join me again with the camera and we can have uh, some of the questions and try to answer you. So who starts? Uh, I will first read the question votes, which is question five. It says, how can the BRICS use the COVID-19 crisis as a turning point for increasing non-economic cooperation in favor of global South countries? That was my question. Um, I have to say that this is a thing that I deeply consider in the sense that BRICS cooperation until now has been mainly following within economic terms. We have BRICS health um, uh, perspectives we had the vaccination um, agreement but that was not necessarily pushed so I would like to ask in this question what exactly um, could have been done and what can these countries learn from the crisis in order to increase military um, health and education corporations maybe you can start Bruno and then Filani thank you very much for the very good question and 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 hard questions to answer, but let's go for that. <laughs> uh, well, in, in my opinion, uh, COVID-19 is indeed uh, a, a very paradigmatic moment. Uh, I don't know yet if as a turning point or rather as something that is, is uh, deepening the contradictions that already exist and exist in our world uh, and then so it's a multi-dimensional crisis it's a political crisis economic crisis social crisis uh, very importantly an ecological crisis and then I, i've been claiming that those two last crises or two last uh, 
dimensions of the crisis are the most important ones that are the social one and the ecological one and uh, for uh, seeing the agenda that you created for this festival i see that you agree with me that well inequality and the ecological environmental dimensions are two of the most important dimensions of the current crisis and i am bringing here the, this discussion because when we talk about global governance uh, in my opinion, those two axes can be the, the, the two most important axes because uh, the COVID-19 also showed as the global governance was, was a total failure, in my opinion. It, it took long for, for us to, to have some kind of coordination among the countries. Uh, we had Trump, which obviously made, the, made things worse. But still, as I said, uh, all countries were trying to, to deal with the crisis on their own, which is totally ineffective because, it, as, as the name says, it's, it's a pandemic, it's a global crisis. And then uh, when we reflect on the problems of the global governance, and coming back to my point, I see that those two axes, inequality and uh, ecological dimension are the two axes that uh, are uh, maybe useful for the construction of a real global governance. Why? Because we have no global governance with this kind of inequality we have currently within countries and uh, between countries. It's really nonsense to talk about global governance when we have countries where everybody or almost when we have countries who bought six times more vaccine than they needed for their population and countries which no vaccine or almost no vaccine as IT. So uh, uh, it's impossible to talk about global governance with this kind, this, this range of inequality. So we have to serial, seriously debate and act to reduce inequality. Otherwise, we won't have global governance, in my opinion. And the second one, the ecological dimension, uh, the pandemic shows that, well, uh, there are many issues, many problems related to the environment which does not respect borders. <laughs> Humankind has uh, organized itself currently at least or in the last centuries through nation states and created borders. But well, climate change does not respect borders. So uh, either we, 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 we face uh, the ecological problems uh, as a humanity globally, collectively, or we will perish collectively. I'm, I'm not the only one who is saying that, it's very clear. What I am saying is that for the global governance, it, it is uh, uh, par excellence uh, the, the, the one topic that has to be dealt internationally, globally, collectively, the, the topic of ecology. So, and here I come to João Pedro's uh, uh, question. In my opinion, BRICS uh, is, has the possibility of acting even more, or it has a big potential, and, and uh, here I agree with Filani, it has a, a big potential, it has shown already some concrete things to the world. So we have already some results of BRICS, but it's still modest in terms of the potential of the possibilities. And then, in my opinion, if BRICS uh, stick in, in these two axes, uh, in a, reducing inequality and facing the, the ecological problems, it, then it may be a turning point. Then it, it may show to the world why it's here, uh, why the bloc was constituted, and, uh, and may bring uh, uh, it may have uh, important outcomes for the reconstruction of a global government and for, for reconfiguring this world, which is uh, really under peril. We are living a humanitarian crisis. And then uh, I hope we will see this turning point that Juan Pedro is, is stating that that can happen. I will start with that. Maybe I can come back later. Yeah, definitely it is a challenge and if there could be a lot of um, indications, but indeed there's a lot of room for, for pessimism, especially considering that the national solutions have one um, in this particular pandemic. So um, maybe Filani would like to contribute a little bit to this question, or also there is a second question con uh, concerning whether the South Africans' participation in the BRICS could provide a route for a further, uh, further development possibilities in the African continent. 
maybe if you could combine both answers i'm not sure or if you want yeah. to like divide them could be good too that's fine that's fine no i think you know under the uh the pandemic i think absolutely i think we've seen that issues that were happening prior to the pandemic have been accelerated so you know we saw a crisis of multilateralism during the pandemic um, a very low point for international cooperation when it should have been a high point instead we had uh, trump pulling out of the wto um, you know we had um, uh, you know influential governments bashing uh, that you know the, the 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 trying to basically cast doubt on on the assessments of the world health organization um and not really support its work so uh it, you know we we had a a nationalistic approach uh to something that all uh, sort of rationality would have told us that you know this is something that we should have approached uh, together and in fact, the failure of multilateralism is exactly what is leading to this prolongment of this pandemic. Um, because, you know, countries are thinking, oh, we'll vaccinate our own populations, we'll stockpile and everything like that. Meanwhile, you know, you've got uh, new variants that are emerging, you know, uh, around the world. So it's, it's, it's really a low point for, for multilateralism. Um, but also, um, depending on how it is actually used, it could be an opportunity, I think, for BRICS countries. What BRICS countries have to focus on um, is, is actually on how to use the crisis to fix some of the glaring problems that we saw during this pandemic. So for instance, one of the huge problems we saw um, in Africa and in other parts of the world was just the absence of regional value chains. Um, you know, we had to basically, uh, I mean, take an example of Africa. I mean, it's not because that, it's not because Africans couldn't buy uh, protective equipment or couldn't buy uh, vaccines or couldn't buy, um, you know, a whole range of things that were needed to fight this pandemic, but they simply couldn't access it um, because, you know, other countries had, had, had bought it or countries were refusing to export it because they wanted to um, uh, use it for their own uh, COVID response and a whole range of things. But what it showed, I think, it, it is that within the global south, we have to fix the problems of the absence of existing regional value chains. Um, because we've seen what happens in a, a, a crisis of this magnitude, that essentially, if you don't have value chains, uh, functioning value chains, you get left out, you, 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 you will be at the back of the queue um and 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 you basically have to fend you know for yourself uh, and this has been a reality for many parts of the world uh, you know pe people are, are are using um uh, as an example people are using uh, traditional medicines and traditional knowledge in order to deal with uh, issues of boosting their immune systems and all of that not because uh, they, 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 they don't want to necessarily vaccinate and all of that, but simply because there aren't vaccines. Why? Because there, aren't, there isn't a production of vaccines within those particular regions. So I think if BRICS countries can focus on those issues, and if we can also tailor, for instance, some of the funding and some of the work of the new development bank, and some of the new development finance towards fixing those issues of uh, regional value chains. And if we can support that, then obviously I think we'll make our, our countries and regions much more resilient in the face of any new 
uh, pandemic that we might face in, in, in the years ahead. So yes, I mean, it, it, it's, it's caught us at our low point when it comes to international cooperation. But if we use the crisis and, and say, what are the areas that uh, the crisis exposed and how can BRICS play a role in actually uh, looking to fix some of those uh, deficiencies, then that would have been a good response. And, and that takes me directly to how, you know, BRICS is an opportunity for, um, for Africa. In fact, um, South Africa's participation within the grouping has always emphasized the, the continental dimension. So uh, already in 2013, when South Africa hosted for the first time uh, the BRICS summit, uh, South Africa insisted on having a BRICS outreach that would involve and invite key African stakeholders um, to participate in the BRICS uh, 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 summit and in the discussions. So it was initially resisted by some within the grouping, but what we've seen is that after the adoption of that outreach mechanism, uh, where African stakeholders were invited to participate, every subsequent summit has had some form of regional outreach, except for instance, there was a break with that um with the um with the brazilian well with the most recent uh, brazil uh, summit under uh, bolsonaro but what it tells you is that uh, is, is 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 that um in terms of you know possibilities for 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 africa there is an anticipation that there will be at least within the new development bank um, that the type of financing that is going to BRICS countries will be expanded over time beyond just your BRICS countries, but that the New Development Bank can also be looking at um, uh, projects in Africa that are able to act as catalytic projects for economic development within the region. So there's definitely... Um, um, sort of an expectation, you know, that membership will be broadened, or at least even if membership is not broadened within the NDB, but that at least the projects um, and the identification of the projects will move beyond the five countries. And that is why these, uh, the fact that, you know, the, the uh, Johannesburg office of the New Development Bank, one of its key tasks is not only to um, identify projects in South Africa, but it's also to identify potential uh, projects within the region. So in that sense, um, BRICS will uh, uh, provide uh, some kind of route, you know, for further development possibilities um, in Africa. You know, the reality on the continent is that, you know, um, Africa is not in a position to choose its partners. So the more partners there are, the more options there are, you know, the better uh, for the continent. And hence, you know, the BRICS uh, does, uh, to some extent, offer that uh, possibility. Thank you very much, Lenny, for the comprehensive answer. Indeed, um, it is very questionable whether the BRICS will be the only solution for African development in the 21st century, but indeed is one of the pathways. Um, I would like them to try and uh, invite Banzile. So he has a question so that he can introduce himself. Perfect. Cool, thank you very much um, to uh, the speakers for the very, very detailed um, uh, contribution so far. Um, um, my name is Banzile, I'm from Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, and I work as uh, one of the co-organizers. My question um, has to do with uh, uh, who all the main stakeholders are in the BRICS uh, formation. Um, uh, and more importantly, 
kind of who is keeping bricks together, who are the people, uh, who are the people or institutions we should be looking out for, uh, and maybe even like supporting, you know, as, as ordinary uh, citizens um, within the BRICS formation. And so uh, Dr. Mtembu hinted at that, listing like the trade unions and civil society groups, but I, I would um, like to hear a bit more about whose work in the BRICS should we follow. Um, if, for example, we would like to uh, see BRICS as a success. Thank you. Have Filani and then just invert the order. Um, so I think, yeah, very good question. And I think it, it, th that question goes to a point also that I, you know, that I'm emphasizing that, in fact, one could argue that uh, some of the more uh, sustainable and, you know, far-reaching work within the BRICS is actually happening um, outside of the state. Um, but obviously it is enabled by the um, the frameworks that have been set put in place by state actors um, South Africa for instance was quite vocal since joining the grouping that it needed to go beyond uh, state to state interactions it needed to um, incorporate uh, much more intentionally uh, think tanks, it needed to incorporate universities, it needed to incorporate the private sector, uh, trade unions, um, and others, you know, I mean, so what you've seen, I think, in, 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 in recent years is sort of a building of uh, an ecosystem in each of the BRICS countries of, um, of non-state actors that are working on uh, BRICS-related issues. Um, so, for instance, in South Africa, you would have, um, and in fact, in all the BRICS countries, you, you, you've you got the ecosystems that have been created by the respective BRICS think tanks or think tank councils. Um, and those are interesting networks, but those are networks also which are still in the formative stage. So they're not sort of um, uh, cast in stone already. But what I'm seeing, particularly in South Africa and in some of the other countries, is that you're increasingly building an ecosystem amongst the various universities uh, within the BRICS countries. Um, so that's something that has been building. Uh, we're seeing a, a bit more uh, opportunities for joint research, for instance, uh, within, uh, within the BRICS. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing the respective BRICS think tanks also uh, funding research now that is looking at BRICS cooperation. Um, and that builds a, a very interesting network and an interesting ecosystem in each of the countries on their own. But it also builds an interesting interaction um, at a, at a, you know, a non-state level amongst the various actors in the different countries because one of the prerequisites you know for the funding that's being provided by the different think tank councils is that uh, this research has to cut across and has to connect institutions across BRICS countries. So these are some of the positive spillover effects of the governments allowing a space, a formal space for cooperation amongst non-state actors uh, within uh, the uh, uh, BRICS uh, countries. And by doing that, you know, it, it, it also makes sure that even outside of those formal structures, so for instance, now we're all preparing for the uh, BRICS Academic Forum that takes place uh, next week um, and, you know, over three days. Um, so, but even outside of those fora, you would then have relations that have been built at a bilateral level between think tanks, between um, other civil society actors, 
and between you know the private sector through the um, uh, through the uh, BRICS Business Forum, um, but you would also have other initiatives uh, where they've you know uh, which of course sometimes it's stop start, but there is an initiative to try and link you know the various BRICS universities. And all of these things do not necessarily depend uh, primarily on government uh, to drive these processes. It depends on the leadership structures uh, at university levels, at think tank levels, at private sector, at you know, at trade union level, to actually drive these initiatives. So what that does is that it 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 sets a certain amount of agency uh, for actors within the BRICS countries to actually shape uh, the space that is that is that is evolving. And I think that is actually where you have much, much greater opportunity to see greater cooperation amongst your BRICS um, uh, countries, because, you know, they could go ahead and, and sign all the different declarations, but those declarations in order to breathe life through them. They rely on the active participation of non-state actors. Um, so I think this is something that, you know, is increasingly um, quite important. And, 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 and I, what I always find interesting is just looking, for instance, at those 100 plus meetings that are happening at each year uh, with each uh, 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 summit. Uh, that's emerging. And when I say 100 meetings, those are only the formal meetings. Um, you've probably got another uh, 100 meetings, which are not on the official uh, calendar of the BRICS um, uh, uh, chairships from year to year. So, you know, with each subsequent summit, you've got this growing ecosystem of interaction amongst BRICS countries. And, 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 and that carries potential um, to instill a certain level of resilience that would take BRICS cooperation even past, you know, um, political turmoil in respective countries um, or change of positions in the respective governments, because you would still have this interaction happening uh, irrespective of who is in government in the respective countries. If you learn, Bruno, maybe. Okay, uh, thanks, Bandidi, for the for the question and for the co-organization of the event. And Filani's response was very comprehensive. I'll, I'll just add, uh, and I, I totally agree with him. I'll just add some some other points. Um, state support is important, in my opinion. I mean, it, it uh, increases the potential of the group. Uh, but as I said, uh, obviously it, it's not a sine qua non uh, uh, condition, because uh, as he said, uh, we, we and this is one of the beautiful things about BRICS is that it created those networks Filani was mentioning. So just to give one example, I, in, in my first presentation, I, I talked about the BRICS Network University, which was created back in 2015, I guess, uh, by the Ministry of Education and so on, and then. We Bolsonaro, uh, the, the Minister of Education in Brazil, was supposed to hold a meeting during the Brasilia summit for the BRICS network universities. And obviously they didn't do it. They didn't give any money. Uh, so uh, in this sense, it, it was a disruption. Uh, it, it could have been a disruption in the process. Uh, and it created problems, uh, notably the lack of funds. But still, since the network had been created before, we organized uh, a meeting uh, that was uh, not for all axes of the BRICS Network University, but at least in economics, we organized a meeting. Uh, so it was smaller than it should have been. And then uh, it, it continued. So just to give an example that uh, to, to, to illustrate what Philani was saying, those networks uh, have been created and then the academy the universities are 
quite important because BRICS, uh, in, 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 I guess in all countries, but I can talk about my country in Brazil, we have been always oriented to what is being created as science, as, as knowledge in US and in Western Europe. Uh, due to economic, political, and historical reasons, the universities in Brazil had, and João Pedro is here, and, and he can confirm what I'm saying, uh, were always oriented to Western Europe and the US. And then uh, the, uh, with BRICS, uh, it, it breaks the barriers and it, it makes us uh, know about what is being created as science, as knowledge in the other four countries. So it's happening regardless of the fact that Bolsonaro does not support as we, we, we the, the group as we, we, we would expect or as we would uh, will. Um, and then uh, as a state policy, uh, I would say maybe, or, or if we, are, we have to choose one institution which has been important for this uh, movement of BRICS, uh, I would say it's the NDB. It's very impressive, the New Development Bank. It's very impressive how quickly it was created. And uh, it's true that it is still far behind of what we could expect in terms of involving other countries, as Shulani said, of uh, getting even more involved in, in, in sustainable uh, financing. And this is the topic of João Pedro in his uh, master dissertation. So uh, we, we can criticize the NDB in many aspects, but uh, we have to, to, to recognize that it was created in, in a very quickly way. And then it, it gives uh, this resilience as well in, 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 uh, for the group, because uh, those commitments are state commitments in terms of giving funds, in terms of giving uh, uh, staff to work in the bank uh, and creating the new regional banks. So, and this is uh, for or this is a concrete thing which is happening and the whole world is discussing it, is debating it. So uh, I would say the NDB has a very important role, not only in itself, but also as a, a, a concrete outcome of, of this group. Verify those understandings, but also the idea that the BRICS are, is a work in progress, progress in the sense that like the definitions and the institutions are still under progress and that's why it's important to have discussions like this one that we're having right now um okay so we have 12 minutes more i would suggest then that we we can go we can have time for um two questions which seem very interesting on china and then we wrap it up maybe uh, i will try to um put both of them together and then we have some final considerations um, first of them, is there a danger that the BRICS Union is propelling China as a new global hegemon rather than challenging the hegemonic system overall? And the second one is, as someone who takes a positive stance on China, how do we tackle some of the financial imperialism? It could be argued that they do, i.e. some of their Belt and Road Initiatives loans are worse than the IMF. Maybe we could have like three to four minutes answers on that, and then I can wrap it up. Maybe we should start with Bruno, because I know that's uh, some of his research area also. Okay. Thanks for the questions as well. Um, and th th this is indeed something we have to be discussing the whole time. The, 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 the role of China within the group and in the world, obviously. And then uh, I, I would say, uh, Regardless of BRICS, there is the possibility, and I guess no one would uh, contradict me, uh, of China becoming a new global hegemon. Uh, and then coming to the role of BRICS, uh, if BRICS is, is fostering that or not, I, I would say uh, that is the point why it's so important for the BRICS to be the whole time uh, thinking about the equality uh, between the five member countries in the discussions uh, within the bloc. Uh, that's why it's so important to keep this idea of having at least equal votes, uh, unlike what, happen what happens with the IMF, uh, as you know, where the US still has veto power. Even today, they have veto power for the most important definitions or decisions in the IMF. So uh, within BRICS, we, have, we will have 
uh, always this, uh, let's say, pressure in the two directions. Because even if in the paper uh, uh, votes are equal and so on, uh, obviously China's power is higher than the other countries. Uh, and then in the other side, those other countries, the other five four countries have to, to try to counterbalance in order to avoid this risk and, and there is, is indeed this risk of China just stepping ahead and taking the group or, or using the group on its own behalf. So uh, it's something, as João Pedro said, it's a work in progress. So it's something which is happening really uh, currently. And then uh, it's something that the, the four other member countries should be attentive in, in my opinion. Uh, but we started uh, be better than the IMF started, for instance. So at least the inception has been uh, different. Uh, the US ha ha had the, the veto power for, for the IMF since the beginning. And up to, even if we had reforms in the votes uh, weight, uh, they keep this veto power. So it is still different. There is the risk, so but it is still different. As for the, very quickly, because uh, as for the, the loans, it's also something we have to follow uh, uh, attentively, but I, I'm not so sure if the, the, the Chinese loans are worse than those of the IMF. I wouldn't say that. Um, uh, the, the, the Western media talks a lot about the debt trap, the possibility of the debt trap. And obviously, external debt is always a problem for all countries. But uh, IMF debt, uh, for instance, uh, creates uh, the, the necessity for the countries to adapt their economies, their societies to a model which was created in the West and for core countries opening up uh, their economies and so on. So we can see many examples of countries who suffered a lot, a lot uh, from the fact of getting loans by, from the IMF. In Latin America, we had a lost decade in the 80s, not only due to the IMF, but uh, the IMF gave a contribution. I, I don't have time here to explore it. And even if you come to, to European countries like Greece, uh, the austerity policies that were imposed created malaria again in, in Greece. So uh, there, there are concrete uh, outcomes and, 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 and very uh, terrible outcomes from, from the loans uh, given by the, the IMF. So, um, and in this sense, China uh, getting indebted, as I said, is always a problem. But uh, there is not uh, this interference in the national uh, economic and political system is not uh, uh, comparable to the one of the IMF. The, the, the most important and dangerous thing, in my opinion, and I finish here, is uh, uh, the, the, the problem to the sovereignty of those countries, notably when they, at the end of the day, have to uh, give or, or make contracts, and it happened for 100 years, to provide oil for, the, for China, 100 years, uh, as a leasing for a harbor or a port. So uh, th this indeed uh, harms the sovereignty of those countries who, which are indebted. So uh, I'm not telling that it's a good thing, but uh, I still think that it's not comparable to the, 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 the IMF loans or and the condi their conditionalities. Right. Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, when it comes to um, uh, loans from, from, from China, I think it's important to, to keep in mind that um, um, it's, it's disingenuous, I think, from to, 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 to make a comparison and say that uh, uh, China's are, are somehow worse or, 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 or not. I mean, it's been quite clear because that any government, right, uh, when you negotiate for particular loans, um, you are responsible for the terms and the conditions that you that you sign on. Um, and what we've tended to see, you know, from you know the loans that have come from uh, China, is that. We've seen them financing, especially 
your productive sectors, uh, which is where I would say that, you know, for many years, uh, Western donors were not willing uh, projects. And you would find that countries in the global south were saying, but that is where we need funding. Um, you know, you take, for example, in Africa, you've got a huge infrastructure backlog um, because, well, in the colonial era, uh, you simply built a road from a mine uh, to the ocean, you know, because you wanted to just get the mine, the goods from the mine to the ocean as quickly as possible. But you never built roads that connected communities or connected countries. You know, so now that we are seeing an increasing amount of funding going towards some of that infrastructure, um, yes, initially there's been an uproar. Will it be affordable? Will it be uh, paid back and all of that? Well, I think the key thing is to check, to say, is this funding going towards just consumption? Um, or is this funding going towards productive sectors that are actually going to make it even easier for those countries uh, to actually repay their loans? So I think we need to have a disaggregated view of um, you know, the type of funding that we are talking about and what impact it has on specific countries. Of course, I mean, with so many uh, loans, uh, uh, you know, being um, mm -hmm. dispersed, you will have, you know, in a continent with uh, 50, more than 50 countries, uh, and just in the broader global south, you will have governments that will sign, um, you know, deals that are not necessarily um, uh, in, 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 in the interests of the people and that are not done transparently and all of that. But I think we must be clear who we need to be directing, you know, uh, let's say anger towards. It's ultimately up to the, it's ultimately up to, if it's in Africa, it's up to an African country to sign deals that are in its people's interests. You know, um, and, and, and I think broadly speaking is that Chinese finance has allowed uh, recipient countries to actually diversify, you know, their borrowing um, and especially in your economic sectors. And as long as it, the financing is not in just debt driven or consumption driven areas and it's actually going to be doing something productive then I think those loans, yeah, will be paid back um, uh, over time. But obviously there will also be um, uh, those countries, you know, that are not able for various reasons, maybe political turmoil um, comes into play, you know, things that are not necessarily predictable all the time. Um, so, but I would definitely not make a blanket statement that, you know, Chinese loans are are worse than IMF or World Bank loans. In fact, empirically, the evidence suggests that um, the loans from the Bretton Woods institutions in much of Africa and, and, and other parts of the developing world have had a worse impact on development and have caused more debt than uh, loans that are coming from China. That's just on an empirical level. And then I think, you know, there is obviously, I mean, uh, you know, with or without uh, BRICS, China is going to be a key player in global politics, with or without BRICS. Um, so BRICS will form part of China's broader grand strategy and broader thinking of where it locates itself in the world. But I think what's important is that because of the manner in which BRICS cooperation has been institutionalized, um, it means that a country like South Africa um, can actually say no uh, to a proposal that's made uh, by China or by Russia uh, or by any of the other countries um, because decisions are reached by consensus. And, 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 and it's not that China uh, has a bigger say, 
you know, even within the new development bank than the other countries. And, and I think that's an important characteristic. And um, that's a characteristic that is likely to also remain because even when expansion uh, happens and you get more members into the new development bank, the original founders of the BRICS development bank will not let go of a majority stake uh, within the bank, uh, which will take care of some of those governance uh, issues where we've seen problems uh, within the Bretton Woods institutions. So at least within the framework of BRICS cooperation, there is no real chance of any country uh, throwing its weight around um, because of the nature in which decisions are actually reached. But, you know, just lastly, I think it's not BRICS that is going to propel China to be a hegemon. Um, it's, you know, China will, will, will reach those levels on its own. But I also don't think that China is going to be a global hegemon in the way we've understood a hegemon uh, under US um, uh, power. Uh, we are likely to see a much more multipolar world that requires uh, greater cooperation and that requires concessions amongst different power blocks rather than seeing a world where China is a sole superpower and recreates, you know, the, the, uh, the global order. I think that's what we're more likely to see. Well, thank you so much, Philani and Bruno, for all those special points that we have went through. I feel that all the questions that we had, even though we didn't ask all the questions, the questions were kind of asked and also went through and answered in a certain way. So, yeah, I would like to thank you very much for your contributions, for sticking up with us, also for the participants. Uh, we had some technical issues in the beginning, also in the middle of the, um, of the session. Sadly, Karin couldn't join, but we have tried to work with her for almost an hour and we couldn't have her perspective on, on this. Her take, I, I know it would be very interesting for all of you. So we will try to take uh, maybe a, uh, some text and send you guys for representing her perspective. But yeah, I would really like to um, thank you, Bruno and Filani, the audience for this incredible um, session on the BRICS. And maybe this is the time for us to wrap it up. We are already three minutes um, beyond the time. And yeah, keep in touch and follow up the festival program for the coming sessions. Thank you very much. Ciao. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.